Good evening, and welcome to the final panel of the convening uh, on creating an anti-racist future. My name is Robert Hampshire. I'm an associate professor of public policy and data science at the University of Michigan's Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy. And we're really glad that you've decided to stick to the very end and join us on this panel this final panel, which will be a, actually a call to action for us as a public interest technology network and community. And how can we actually move forward in proactive ways to create an anti-racist future? You know, throughout the convening, we've seen re many researchers in the public interest technology community exploring the intersection of technology, racial equity, and social justice. For this panel, we're going to explore what that means to adopt an explicitly anti-racist framework to inform researchers and practitioners alike in PIT. You'll see that the great guests and experts we have on the panel will make this free-flowing, keep it lively here at the end of the conference. But ultimately, we want to challenge us as a community to really move forward to make this anti-racist future. So with that, let me introduce just the great set of panelists that, that we've have assembled here today. And I'll just do a short introduction uh, to each of them and then we'll kind of get going to the meat of the uh, panel, okay? First, I'd like to introduce Dr. Jessica Symes. She's a associate, an assistant professor of sociology and associate director of research for the Boston University Center for Anti-Racist Research. Her research examines racial and health disparities in criminalizing and punitive experiences and the broad consequences of mass incarceration for communities and neighborhoods in the United States. She received her BA from Occidental College and her PhD in sociology from Harvard University. Welcome, and we're really looking forward to this interaction. Secondly, I'd like to introduce Dr. Fallon Wilson the co-founder of several organizations, but many, mostly, uh, most recently, the Black Tech Futures Research Institute. Dr. Wilson uh, also was the former research director at Black Tech Mecca. Uh, she was awarded uh, many awards, but particularly from the Kauffman Foundation's Open Knowledge Grant that actually helped launch the Black Tech Futures Research Institute. Dr. Wilson's research also includes looking at first generation college students and alternative pathways within the tech ecosystem. You know, that's some work that we've done at Mission as well to look about the career pathways and tech ecosystems. And so, uh, Dr. Wilson, this really looking forward to gaining more insights about, you know, your work. Um, you know, you've you had a BA from uh, Spelman College and also an MA and PhD from the University of Chicago. And, uh, you know, as a public interest technologist, you know, I've followed you uh, over the years as you discuss, you know, issues in race, gender, faith. You know, I just want to say that again. And, and faith community, I think also is a big role here that, you know, I think is potentially uh, untapped. So hopefully we can talk about that, the faith community and civic tech issues. So uh, welcome. And certainly last but not least, we have Vitaly Nkundu, who's a founder of CEO, founding CEO of AI for the People, a nonprofit communications agency. Uh, throughout her career, uh, you know, she certainly started as a, a broadcast journalist, uh, producing documentaries for many uh, networks that you know, but also as an AI policy advisor and who's worked very closely with legislation and Congress. Uh, people, you know, during her time at AI governance, you know, was involved in, you know, launching and leading the first sort of legislation around algorithmic bias and deep, fa deep fakes in the Congress. And so she has deep experience uh, from the broadcasting and journalism, but also legislatively and also from a communication standpoint. And so we're just so fortunate and um, lucky in many ways to have you on the panel. Uh, and so Welcome all three. I know that all three of you has, have biographies that are extensive. And so we just really just scraped the surface. 
so we can kind of jump into what do we mean by creating an anti-racist future, particularly in, in the role of public interest technology. So let me just tee Jessica up here. And, and given that you're the co-director and, and director of research at the Anti-Racist Research Center at, at Boston University at BU, can you kind of get, first give us, you know, what does it look like? What does it mean to take an anti-racist view on public interest technology, but what does that anti-racist future look like uh, from, your, from, your, from your view? Thank you, Robert, and thank you all. Um, I am so honored to be on this panel. Um, I truly, uh, yeah, I'm deeply humbled and so excited to share and engage in this wonderful and truly urgent conversation. Um, I wanna start with just a quote from, you know, the, the really powerful quote from Angela Davis, Dr. Angela Davis, in a racist society, it is not enough to be non-racist. We must be anti-racist. And I think, you know, for us at the center, but for all of us who are working in public interest technology, being anti-racist is a radical stance and it's an active stance against racism, which is unbearable in our society and it is a crisis in our society. It is a pandemic in our society. And so to be anti-racist is a radical choice in the face of centuries of dehumanization and um, de, you know, sort of removing people from their uh, ability to have uh, lives full of dignity and well-being and, and political power. So from a research perspective, we think that racist research historically asks the question, what is wrong with people? Meaning what is wrong with individuals or groups and why aren't they just figuring it out? We ask a different question we at, at the center and I think all of us, uh, which is what is wrong with policy? Um, and our belief is that framing research on race and racism around anti-racist questions leads to anti-racist narratives, anti-racist policy solutions, and really impactful anti-racist advocacy campaigns that cut to the root of racism, which is racial policy and in, in racist policy. So being here today, and um, I'll finish a little bit here is, you know, racial data science, I think, asks sort of two important questions, which is how do we collect data ethically and in a way that can really shine a light and be um, an important um, way for us to share the reality of racism, but also our approach to data can be anti-racist as well. Um, and so I'm gonna stop there and let my other panelists jump in, but um, that's sort of a, how I would start by answering your question. No, this is a great, uh, great, they sort of lay the, the framework with the quote from the incomparable Angela Davis. And that's just a, a really great way to, to start us off, you know, and, you know, when it comes to anti-racist framework for public interest technology, really, I think, let me maybe turn to the Fallon to kind of build off of, of things that Jessica mentioned there. Does that sort of jive with your conception of an anti-racist uh, future in the role of public interest technology? Yes, definitely it does. But I probably would add a little bit more to it, um, particularly through the lens of Blackness, right? I think when we think about public interest technology, we really need to think and acknowledge some things, right? We need to first acknowledge that Black and Brown people have always done technology, that this is not new, just because we're now thinking about it in this new discipline. Um, I think it's really important to think about the history of it, right? And, and of course, Charlton Black software books should be like the foundational reading for all those who are thinking about building an anti-racist framework in, the, in this new discipline that we're trying to canonize. I think you also have to acknowledge that, you know, data bias and big data and all the things we love to talk about in the network and, and, in the, and on the practice side for, you know, as a practitioner, um, that's not new either, right? I mean, black and brown bodies have always been tracked in surveillance and have used various technologies to do that over the, over the, over the time, right? I think you also have to acknowledge as we really try to really operationalize what does an anti-racist framework look like for public interest technology specifically, you gotta look at some of the research that's out there that's 
being done by the K-Port Center and their Leaky Tech Pipeline that looks at all the structures that, sh that tailor and intersect that make it very difficult for black and brown people to co-create this new tech world. Um, and then I think you also then have to interrogate the definition of public interest technology. Ooh, I know that's something we don't like to talk about because I think there's so many definitions flying out. I, I can't find the definitive one, right? But of course, most of them deal with the public interest, the public good, but we can problematize public good and what it means for people that look like me. Sometimes it doesn't necessar necessarily intersect. I'll give an example. Uh, one of, I guess, a practitioner organization that you can say that does public interest technology work, Code for America. Uh, many of us are familiar with it, right? I think back in 2016, I was one of 10 African Americans that was at the conference and they did a, a presentation on how to make drones more efficient in dropping bombs on enemy targets as a public good. I sat there saying to myself, is this, is this what we mean when we talk about public interest and public good and it's from an anti-war framework and also as a person of color, what does that look like when you think about how those technologies could also be used here? And so I think you have to acknowledge that black folks and brown folks have been doing technology. You have to interrogate the concept and you also have to interrogate the conception of public interest technology. How did it come about? What spaces was it nested in? And how do you really make it open and accessible to people who are not at Research One universities, who are part of various non-academic settings? Because it's always very interesting to me. Of course, I have a PhD. I went to the University of Chicago. I went to Spelman, which I love. So I shout out to Stacey Abrams. Um, but I also realized that we spend so much time doing research on the people that we have not yet figured out how to translate these worlds and these concepts of civic tech, gov tech, um, public interest technology in a way that people would take it up and join our cause. And, I, and lastly, I would say you really, yes, I think you have to interrogate the concepts from the beginning. If it's gonna be a true anti-racist framework, you have to talk about the origin of it and how people use it and think about it, who's at the table and who's not. Um, and I think that's, that's where we begin. So I'm gonna pause right there from my, my other panelists. Yeah, so, um... Dr. Wilson, that's incredible uh, insight about interrogating the public interest, right? And looking at it from a critical perspective. Uh, one of my colleagues at the University of Michigan, Shabita Parthaswarthi, you know, has this term called critical data science. Like, so is there sort of a critical interrogation of what the public interest is? And it, certainly that hasn't been in the interest of, you know, uh, African Americans and people of color in this country for all incredibly long time. And so I think that's a great point to, as a starting point is what is to be critical about that. Um, and so that's really a great insight. Uh, and so Metali, let me turn to you to kind of think about tying together these, you know, definitions of what this anti-racist future might look like. I, I kind of look at you as a visionary. You've always sort of been ahead of the curve on many things in AI and data science and governance. So like, what's your vision for this what is, what's your vision for this anti-racist future? Um, in my, first of all, my fellow panelists, I think have done a really comprehensive job in terms of definition, but where I would take it a step even further is when we're speaking about blackness, what blackness are we speaking about? I'm um, in the process of writing my first book, um, Automated Anti-Blackness. And I had to acknowledge that as a woman, uh, who grew up in the UK, who is an African immigrant. I naturalized in time for the election, y'all. So I did what I had to do because I'm clearly a black woman and we did what we had to do, different Zoom. But um, many of the people that are prominent and get attention are African immigrants, right? So even when we think about this idea of blackness, we also have to understand that within the tech industry, there is a particular there is particular pushback for African Americans, those that have been here generationally. And so as we're thinking about justice, there has to be intergroup justice to make sure that if I'm in a room, then I'm in a room with Jamal, Keisha, Tanya, and them. Otherwise, I don't know that it's truly reflective of this country. The other thing I would say, 
and this is where um, I kind of pitch my star against is that I do believe that policy is the delivery system for ideology. So if I'm really going to think about an anti-racist future, then the way that those markets are reshaped have to be codified into law and codified in such a way that they don't inadvertently promote white supremacy. Because I think all of us would agree that the, I, this racial caste system, to use Isabel Wilk Wilkinson's phrase, was something that was written into law. It was something, you know, th this is not naturally, to be racist is not natural, right? To be racist is, the, is really the choice of laws, policies, and practices that have been adopted over 500 years that bring us to what we think is natural. So in my um, speculative view of an anti-racist technical future, which is what I speak about a lot, we would have everything that has been mentioned prior, but we would also have changed our laws to incentivize that type of behavior. So can I give you an example of that? When we were writing the Algorithmic Accountability Act, for example, one of the things that we demanded was a um, was a kind of like an FDA type agency that men, if you looked at an algorithm, we can't, you know, explainability isn't there because of IP, but if we see that that algorithm is discriminating against any particular group, it's not allowed to be released into the marketplace versus what happens now, you and your white friends, uh, you're probably male, you design an app, it's in the marketplace, and then black women's lives are in danger or, or whatever. So in so that would be the first thing. And then the second thing in terms of my vision for an anti-racist future is that ultimately I'm a professional communicator. So in the projects we've done, we would use um, popular culture, we use film, we use journalism, we use all of these delivery systems to make sure that if you were saying defund the police, you also know that you're talking about facial recognition technology. If you are saying that you want to live in a just society, right, an anti-racist society, that you're also thinking about the algorithmic decisions that are being made about you and pushing against that. And that's definitely, um, I'd be happy to speak more as we get into this conversation, but I would, I would say those would be the two major things uh, that would be in my vision. Okay, of course, again, you've uh, sort of laid the groundwork for a, a vision that, you know, we can maybe all get behind. Um, really looking forward to your book when you're finished, by the way, uh, a plug there. Um, but, you know, I think you've sort of moved us, to, you know, sort of synthesize, you know, things that Jessica and, and Fallon have talked about with anti-racist and then kind of what that future looks like, but also then started to move us towards examples of that or what that might look like in practice, like you mentioned with the, the algorithmic transparency work that, in legislation that you kind of worked on. You know, um, Fallon mentioned that, you know, Charles Shelton's book about black software and how black people have been involved, particularly in technology for many, many years. Uh, I find myself at this intersection. So I, I'm trained as a, my PhD is in engineering. And also now I find myself in a public policy school, but I know that my PhD was paid for uh, by Bell Laboratories and Bell Laboratories has a, an incredible history of black scientists uh, going back to the 1930s. You know, they broke the color line before, you know, Jackie Robinson, uh, someone named Lincoln Hawkins, uh, who basically invented fiber optics, someone named Dr. Jim West, who created the modern day microphone. So the microphone that's on all your, you guys' computers was basically invented by a black man at, at Bell Labs. And there's this great history of black people being involved in technology. And particularly now, I think we accelerate that beyond just involvement to accelerating this, converting that to actually anti-racist technology. Because one thing I have learned is that just having the bodies there in the same structures aren't is it always, that's the first step. That is a step, but it's not, it doesn't convert completely to sort of anti-racist technology or perspective that pushes pushes us forward. Um, and so, I, you know, I think some of the work that, particularly, I, I'll kind of turn back uh, to Jessica here. Like, do you, are there particular 
examples of kinds of work, be it in data science, PIT, civic tech, or more broadly, that you would consider we kind of hold up as, as work uh, that, that moves us closer to this anti-racist future? Yeah, I mean, first, the work of my colleagues on this panel, um, very much. <laughs> I'm really inspired by data for Black lives. And um, something that one of my panelists um, said earlier really has stuck with me, which is I think we can think really expansively about who gets to be involved in data, data collection, data analysis, writing about and narrating the data. And so I think um, one of the most powerful things about the movement for Black Lives is how much, and broadly, not just data for Black Lives, but the movement has really shown how much data can, can drive a whole new narrative and a whole new set of policies, but um, it, it comes from the community. Um, and so I think that it's, uh, while there are, there are so many wonderful organizations that are doing this, I also wanna make sure that that is always anchored in the community that is most affected by all of these policies. Yeah, that's, that's a great point to keep us anchored in the sort of community, the users, the people who actually and kind of co-create uh, these things. So that's really incredible. So speaking of, you know, the, the work of the great people on this panel, you know, to kind of push us towards this anti-racist future. I don't know, Dr. Fowler, can, Wilson, can you say a bit about, you know, Black tech futures and, and how that work fits into uh, what we're talking about? Is it possible for me to build on something Jessica said first and then, and then jump there? Absolutely. I think... Uh, you're right. I think part of it is that data can be liberatory in the sense of co-creation. But I come to find that when we think about public interest technology research projects, once again, I think we have fads, right? Or we have those issues that we're most comfortable with talking about. Bias algorithms, um, having a competitive market of, with the ISPs, um, interoperability issues. There, there are just a set of, there are just, we have very privileged conversations and issues we like to have conversations about and to do research projects on and to mobilize people on. But then I think back, I said, can I just get a broadband data map of those who have access to the internet that look like all of us on this, on this panel? And the FCC has not updated those things, right? And companies will not give that data access. And so we think about developing a pipeline of public interest technologists and you want it to be as diverse and as varied as the various bodies and minds and spirits that are on this call, but I can't get that because so many of people who look like me lack access to quality high-speed broadband. The challenge with that is it is not a sexy topic. It is not talking about biased data. It's not talking about how Facebook algorithms are trying to get, it is not, it is not, it is not, there's something very class specific about it, right? Um, and the assumption is that everybody has internet. That is not true. And what we've realized in this new pandemic and this re new remote learning world that we all find ourselves in, even if you do have access to broadband and you have five people at home and they're all using the same data, it drags and it creates disparities. I fear to think about the learning loss of black and brown children because we have yet to figure out how to address the broadband issue because I can't get data on who actually has access. And so when you think about a, a project for Pitt, that is a project. Is it sexy? No, but is it needed? Yes. And so part of the work that I do, and I'm excited because, you know, I, I had the fundraise for this institute um, to launch and it's launching next week. Um, and it's entitled Black Tech Futures Research Institute. And what we believe is that the true answer to policy, um, my, my beautiful panelists laid out, is at the national level, but you have to start at the municipal level, right? You need to understand at the, at the, at the basis what is going on in the municipalities as it relates to smart cities. And then how do you translate that to everyday black and brown folks so they can understand it, co-create policy, and, and, and build an aggregation of conversations across cities in the South in particular. And so I think 
I'm probably rambling. I'm a little excited. Um, but I just believe that if we really are going to have an anti-racist framework for public interest technology, we will have to broaden the level of issues that we tend to talk about. And we really have to start at the local level. And there are a lot of amazing university partners doing great work. And I think that there are a lot of them thinking about these things, but because it is not, once again, I hate to use the term, mm, fashionable, um, exciting, um, because who wants to look at broadband maps? Nobody, but it's needed when we think about creating a foundation um, and it's needed when we think about research and it's needed when we think about how do you build a movement. If no one gets on the, if no one can access the internet and we can't hold the companies accountable, we will only be the privileged in the Ivy Leagues and in the spaces having these conversations and it will never be a mass movement for equity in this new technology world we're building. One of yeah, my colleagues at Boston University calls it digital redlining. Um, this idea that um, whole, I mean, another thing I'd layer on too is um, telehealth and how many people without access to broadband or internet are not accessing um, very basic diagnostic services because they can't access telehealth. Um, so it's a huge problem and it's absolutely, you know, affecting black and brown communities the most. And, and I would say very quickly that my work is at all levels. My next project is actually city specific, New York City. So I would encourage us to not think about all our work in the terms of a project, but there's a, an expansive universe. Yeah, so Natalia, can you kind of say a little bit more about that, particularly, you know, some of the work you, you know, AI for the people and, and what you can maybe tell us about this new project or, or how, yeah, you know, sure. examples of, of the kind of work you're doing? Yeah, sure. So um, AI for the People started a year ago. I often say that we are a baby of um, the Pit Network in, in many ways because it was launched through a, um, a conference while I was at Harvard called Black in 2020. And we were looking at that point, two major questions. How would social media algorithms impact the 2020 election and going down kind of the disinformation road? And we chose to follow uh, racially charged disinformation agents. And we were looking at three cities, Philadelphia, Detroit, and Milwaukee. So uh, research was broadly on the internet, how were these messages following, and then working with uh, Black Lives Matter uh, um, affiliated groups in each of those three cities, and, in, and then launching a counter narrative because we are storytellers. So our partner was moveon.org. We were able to launch a campaign um, called Vote Down COVID because we found in each of those three cities the stories that we were getting, particularly from young Black men, and the videos that we released spoke specifically to COVID, but even that was gendered. Like the guys would talk about losing their jobs, the, the women would often talk about their families and life and, and being in the, you know, being a teacher and being at work. And the, our target was a hashtag um, called uh, Vote Down Ballot which was uh, released by a group called the American Descendants of Slaves. And we tracked from, we started the research project in November last year. We're just finishing up um, doing our last data uh, drive next week. And we actually spotted that Ice Cube was being mentioned and becoming active within this network around July. So, um, I'm really looking forward to kind of following that. And we had spotted that Black men were much more susceptible to the disinformation um, messages. So we're really excited about that work. Uh, we outperformed the hashtag and we actually, um, we have, we placed an article in the Harvard Kennedy School Misinformation Review. And what we're hoping is that that will lay the groundwork for disinformation work being done by Black people for Black people looking at Black things. Because AI for the people is, is friends with Black people doing stuff about Black people for Black people doing Black things. So um, we were really proud of that. That was kind of our launch project. And we are just 
transitioning into a project that looks at facial recognition. So the way our agenda is set around the congressional work I was able to do, which were in three broad areas, algorithmic bias, which I always say is just the idea that computers can be racist, machines can be racist. So we do that work because to Dr. Wilson's point, if the old ladies that I go to church with don't know that an algorithm is, is biased, then I haven't done my job. What's the point of having a communications firm in the network if my mother from the church doesn't know that when she goes to get her, when she goes to get her benefits, that there, that there are, you know, there, there's this nonsense afoot. And that's really my audience. Secondly, we look at, um, in deep fakes, we were looking at what we call information integrity, because we believe that the first disinformation campaign was that Black people are not human. We take it there. We're not waiting for all of these fancy schools, and I know you're probably all watching me shout out Ivy League, but <laughs> Black folks knew about disinformation before you wrote your y'all papers. So the fact that we don't have more experts in that field seems very ludicrous, and we're interested in changing that. And then the third thing we look at is biometrics, just because what we're in terms of market forecasting, technology is moving away from the screen and we're moving really towards ambient technologies. So things like facial recognition, gait recognition, stingray. And we were really fascinated with the George Floyd protests and what happened within the context of COVID and racial justice because we saw two you know two things jessica i am so excited that you're here and i hope that we will get to um collaborate going into the future but dr um Dr. Kendi's book was number one because people had this renewed interest. The New York Times say that Black Lives Matter protests after George Floyd may be the largest social movement in US history. How do they know that? They scraped social media data and looked where people were uploading and found that 500,000 Americans of all races reported to being at a Black Lives Matter protest on June 6 from 50,000 unique places. So from an organizing standpoint, that's a lot of white people out there saying Black Lives Matter, and we don't live everywhere. So there were places and spaces where we are not at, but that that message had been found. And so we were really interested in, well, what was the surveillance around that? So we are doing a work, uh, we're doing work with Amnesty International, and we are um, specifically looking at the NYPD and their use of uh, biometric technology on protesters in New York City. So we have all the FOIL requests out. Shout out NYPD. We will sue you and get our data. We will. Shout out Department of Justice. Y'all are about to be out. So we will hopefully have someone we can work with. But then really looking at where these technologies place, much like Dr. Wilson, if we don't have these maps, we don't understand the scope of the problem. What do these contracts say? How are they used? And then we're working with activists. We're very much, um, we're finding that the active black activist community really, um, really gravitate towards our work. And I think that's just because all, all movements have art and we create art around these themes. Um, and we're, 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 we're um, producing a film that kind of goes through not just the activist story and the COVID story, but also the way biometric technology was used to arrest um, two activists here in New York City. And you know, you can you can read, you can, if you, if you can't read, I will send them to you. Shout out, you know, you can contact me. But that's the work that we're doing, and our goal is to push for to create the type of pressure that will push for a ban. Because again, AI for the people really does believe that ideology is the delivery, policy is the delivery system of ideology. And so we want to change the way stuff looks, whether we are working on that project or not. So, um, you know, we're a baby org, but our model seems to be really robust. Uh, yeah, <laughs> what an incredible set of activities and partnerships and community that you guys are building and leading. I think. One thing for the you know Pit UN, uh, our our network is really embracing this broader notion of one what technology means. We'll come back to that, but then also the set of stakeholders and people who are involved. You you said something that was beautiful. You know, technology is art. You said you guys are creating art. You know, and there's then there's activists involved and you know various you know data scientists and storytellers. I think that broad coalition 
is something that you know we can really move forward on, not just in some academic way where we're you know researching and writing papers, but in the real world, like on the ground. And I, and I think policy that's makers and policy and po makers too. Um, we, we you know you and I shared earlier. I was surprised when I got a, an email from the Biden folks being like, we we. You know, we've been following the work that you're doing. This is something that we're interested in. Send us ideas, send us proposals. So this, um, and uh, policymakers at all levels, in the facial recognition system, we're working with the New York City, of the, the Office of the New York City Public Advocate, because they want to introduce, um, they're really introduced in, 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 interested in legislation and they did the stuff that we had done on the congressional level and they want to see whether it would work on the city because they need art too. Plus this is fun. Like everything in our work is centered in, in black joy. If you just want to have some fun and, and advance some justice, that's not <laughs> Absolutely. <fun. laughs> For sure. And, and, and I'm going to turn to Dr. Wilson here in a second, but you know, this idea of really proactively, directly being pro-black and working on turning data on his, on his head to, for that purpose, you know, and, and have that something that's, upfront, you know, because oftentimes, and rightfully so, we think about like data bias and, you know, misinformation, and those are issues, but we can also then turn those things into proactively, you know, help build social movements, you know, help, you know, actually think about outcomes and education and like, but, but do it in a way that's proactive. And I think that's part of what this anti-racist future <laughs> sort of looks like, you know, um, but let me just kind of, take a little step back. And, and so we kind of mapped out a little bit of this vision uh, and some of the exciting things that are happening. But part of the Pitt University Network aspect is also getting students and others, traditional and non-traditional students, ready to engage in this, in this field, in this work. And I know that uh, Dr. Wilson, you know, particularly think about career pathways and ways in which people kind of find their way <laughs> into this kind of work. I mean, I think you have some interesting perspectives on that. Do you want to tell us a bit about um, that? Some of your work? Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. I believe that, I just want to say four years ago, five years ago, when public interest technology was coming on the scene, I said, and I still will say that first generation Black students, this is like, should be the the ultimate career choice for them, primarily because they major in and also tend to work in human service-based careers in government, right? And so social work, anything around relating to impact and community, even first-generation college students who major in STEM and computer science will tell you the reason why I do this work is not to be the Mark Zuckerbergs of the world and disruption, I want to have community impact. And so for me, it is, I feel like I've preached it to many foundations. If you're watching, give me a call. Um, we really should be thinking about how historically Black colleges and universities should be nested within Pitt. I know Howard is a part of the network, and I want to shout out Andreen for working very diligently to get more historically Black colleges and universities to be a part of this network, primarily because of what they stand for, right? They are pro-Black, let's be clear, um, and they are about creating Black and Brown leaders who are committed to justice and, and, and creating a, 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 a integrated narrative of what it means to co-create a future for people who look like me. And so for me, public interest technology was a natural fit for first-generation Black college students. Even for me, you talked, Robert, you talked about how you were an engineer and now you're in this space. My researchers really looking at, it was in gender studies. It was a black feminist to its core, um, looking at how to create safe environments for learning for black and brown girls, right? I tell the story, how did you get into technology? I can't, unlike the beautiful, is it Natalie? I, Natalie, I can't code myself out of a paper box. Literally, I cannot. And matter of fact, when I tell people what is code, it's a bracket, zero, zero slash bracket. That's what I, that's what I tell them, right? Um, yeah. But, but, but listen, 
the reason why I learn about technology, why do I learn about interoperability, why do I learn about bias data, is because I want to be able to translate this world for people who look like me. I grew up poor. I had an uncle who drove a truck. He made $24 an hour. When we had crisis, we went to that uncle who had the $24 hour job and benefits to deal with the issues in our family. When I found out that automation is likely to decimate truck driving or other types of low skill work, it worried me. And I said, we cannot, I cannot be someone who's committed to the liberation of my people if we cannot figure this out, right? And so I do this work of translating and I have been a public interest technologist since 2016. Um, outside of a university setting, right, telling the story of how we have to better translate this world. I will say it again, we have very privileged conversations with either academics or activists, but then in the middle, there's a whole very different groups of black and brown people who know nothing about this world, but who has been pushed into it because of a pandemic. And now everyone is trying to figure out, how do I do remote learning? How do I get access to broadband? How do I connect with my church and mosque and my families? How do we do community? And so technology has come and just landed on them. And we have not prepared them to figure out how to negotiate it so that they are not taken advantage by Zoom. I'm not saying Zoom is taking advantage, but I'm not saying we have not done any studies. I don't know. But I love it that every Black church I know is on Zoom. The larger point I'm trying to make here is that if we are really trying to grow a network of additional types of students who will go on once we canonize public interest technology, we need to ensure that historically black colleges and universities are part of this discussion. We have to think about the frameworks and the issues and they're gonna have to be broader than what we tend to talk about. And lastly, you need to talk to these amazing people on this panel and others like us to access our stories or how did we decide that we would do this work? It is not simply because I wanna disrupt and be a Mark Zuckerberg and have a unicorn tech startup. It is because I care about the lived experiences of black people to be able to say how they live their lives in a fully automated world. And I, 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 think, I think that's where I would land on that. Yeah, so Dr. Wilson, I think you, your story is is so powerful, <laughs> and it, it actually is an exemplar of of many others who are people of color, particularly who are working in this PIT space. So part of our, I was leading a project at the University of Michigan for our PIT Year One grant. We interviewed uh, sets of PIT practitioners of color, <laughs> and really to try to get their stories. We you're on. A, we got to come back to you guys. I think I've talked to some of you guys already. But to really try to distill out, like, what do those career pathways look like? And oftentimes, you know, some of them are people coming straight from, like, STEM and technology pathways. But, you know, life can go in many different ways. And so many people are coming from, particularly people of color, from non-technical backgrounds. A lot of people from marketing, communications. Uh, you get people from the arts who are now you know, working squarely in this space and actually leading. So these pathways that we're finding from our interviews and also from data, it shows that it's a very complex picture of how people get into and move through career paths. Um, and that's something for students and, you know, students of all kinds, traditional and non-traditional can really, this is a field that is open, it's an interdisciplinary field that's focus on impact. And so anyone who's interested in that impact, engaging with the community can really plug into it. Um, so I think your story is so great. Um, and so let me actually turn a little bit to, we have a couple questions that are related to this. And so someone asked a question about, particularly for, maybe this is best for Jessica, the question is about students that you see who are interested in anti-racist work and research, do they make that connection with technology from your experience? Um, 
Such a good question. Um, and I, I, it actually kind of builds on what Dr. Wilson was saying, in my view. I, I, um, I look to our universities, how much are you prioritizing anti-racist curriculum? Um, is it relegated to a half of a day in your courses, or is it a required course for your computer engineering students, your data science students? Um, do you prioritize this in your broader curriculum, and how do students feel when that isn't a priority? And they don't feel like their experiences are reflected in the broader curriculum, um, especially in technology. And um, so something that we want to do at the Center for Anti-Racist Research is build a set of curriculum and tools to actually provide um, whole semesters and years worth of education around what it means to practice anti-racist data science and anti-racist technology broadly. Um, but I, I push on the idea, you know, that I think for, for, we were talking about pipeline and career trajectories, but I have had black students come into my office and say, I've never had a black professor. I've never taken a class on uh, anti-racism. And, um, and that's a, that to me is a total institutional failure. Um, and we can do better and we must do better. Um, and our courses need to reflect this because frankly, you can't work in technology without a, a, the understanding that what we're doing is reproducing inequality unless we interrupt it and stop it. So it's a, it's a failure in our education. It's a failure from a justice perspective. It fails our students. And so I think that my students in particular are really eager to learn about these things and find experiences um, both inside the classroom and beyond. No, that's that's a good insight about you know how particularly building curriculum because I know many universities in the Pitt in UN network here many projects are actually about building curricular curriculum particularly in computer science and how they really think about revamp you know revamping the ethics but now going beyond and saying anti-racist content in the computer science. Um, work you know directly much more directly so i think many people are probably going to be reaching out to you jessica uh, uh, related to uh curricula for for students and technologists to, to go through particularly as the focus on anti-racism um so that's that's really strong i mean now i want to still open it up for questions for those who are uh sticking with us here on the friday uh night on the last panel please uh you know in the chat window put in your questions and insights, and I hope to kind of get to them. Uh, there's a bunch of them that are, are coming in. Um, and it kind of ties into, the next question ties into something that, uh, Metali, that I think that, I think you may be best uh, positioned to answer. And it's kind of, you know, us academics can sort of, you know, get into curriculum and writing papers and, but like, how do we translate that to, practice i'm a in a public i'm a professor in a public policy school how do we convert that and translate those things to policy action mm -hmm. you know and i think you touched on it a little bit with some of your experience but you know do you have any advice or from your experience of how to translate yeah. you know this pit research into practice so my particular case i had been an active member of the Congressional Caucus of Black Women and Girls for since about 2013, because uh, they had met me when I was contracting with Google and really doing a lot of kind of community engagement work in the New York uh, City area. And so there was already trust and, and credibility. So as I built relationships with that particular network, I started to learn what the policy priorities were of uh, folks that were, I was very strategic. I was looking at folks that were looking at committees that were overseeing technology. And I found that they were interested in diversity in hiring in the field, um, which, which I thought was kind of a, I, I, I thought that was a red herring. I, that's not really a real problem. I've been in those tech firms. They hire black people all the time. Those black people stay for 15 minutes because they're not here for that and they leave. So I, I and I was able to kind of push them towards um, algorithmic bias, but obviously that was, um, especially after Kathy O'Neill's book dropped, 
because it was so easily digestible, I then could go to them with something that they could that they could understand, but really aligning their existing uh, priorities and then illustrating how technology was changing that. So biometric, so for no biometric barriers, I was working with somebody that was interested in housing writ large, right? Had been looking at public housing, long history in public housing. And then here I came and said, facial recognition is gonna change housing for black people. Uh, not just as a technology that's in the entranceway, but do you know about ring doorbells? And, and then that started with the algorithmic bias. I really have to thank Kathy O'Neill's book for even raising that point, the idea that technology wasn't neutral. And then with deep fakes, that became, um, that became a real issue because I was in the Congressional Caucus of Black Women and Girls. And we were at that point reading uh, Sophia Noble's book about the pornification of Black women and girls, algorithms of oppression. And then they, and then there was a deep fake video that had been made of Scarlett Johansson at the beginning of 2019. And there was all this press about Scarlett Johansson and what happened to her was terrible. But I was then able to go in because I was in a black feminist space. I was, you know, Kumbaya River Collective was something that we were, that we were really interested in. We're reading Audre Lorde, we're reading Bell Hooks. Like I'm with my people, right? And so then it was very easy to make a black feminist case for intervention based on that particular technology. That's my particular story. Um, I think for people in the network that are interested in impacting policy, the first thing that you have to have are real relationships. And no matter how many papers you write and how great you are in the academy, that actually doesn't track um, outside of the academy. You have to have some type of impact. I mentioned these incredible books that women had wrote, for, written, for example, that was the way of, of having impact. Um, and then that gives you a platform because often you are speaking to people that have three minutes to hear what you have to say and what you say in those three minutes has to align with his existing priorities. So my advice would be the same work that we put into making sure that our papers um, can be critiqued and the critique is firm because our methodology is good has to then be applied to the policy space. And we're at this exciting moment we're in, in some ways where we're having a new administration that is more interested in science, but let's not joke. This is a neoliberal ticket who are already hiring people from industry. So the next four years, if you are somebody that is interested in racial justice and technology and racial literacy in technology, which is something I speak about a lot, um, in anti-racist technology, then we have, to, we have to build a movement because Eric Schmidt, is not it. And he is like their number one uh, person. But, you know, I've been here a while. I've been here, this is what, my eighth, my ninth year. They know when I'm coming, I'm about to, <laughs> to set off. So, you know, we'll leave it there. No, you're, you bring up a great point about having, I call it like a dance partner, right? So yeah. when you're building those relationships with policymakers, I mean, you need to have a partner on the other side who really, you know, uh, can elevate those issues and actually value them. But it's a conversation. You're a communications person. So I mean, those lines of communication and, and language need to be clear that we're addressing issues of you know, importance to them and their constituents. You know, there's a so question here. Yeah, I sorry, go ahead. Is that we always partnered with researchers. So the researchers in the PIT UN network, for example, okay end up being great partners for us because if they cannot translate their research, we can, that's our job. Um, and we're, I'm always looking for people to testify on panels. I'm always looking because the people that get to give testimony, you being written into record, whether it's in the state, city, municipal level, is really important and there should be a diverse field. I am, um, you know, I, I definitely take an organizer's stance. If I'm the only person saying this, I've done something wrong. The, in every city, in every place in this country, there should be somebody saying that. And then if we look at this last election, who delivered, who delivered for us? It was the hoods of the city. Yeah. It was people in the hood in Detroit. It was people in the hood in, in Philadelphia. It was people yeah. in the hood. Of, so those people need to be represented as well as the academics 
that are doing that work who quite frankly, I mean, I'm very academic adjacent. I've taught these uh, classes at, at Stanford. I'm on another fellowship at Notre Dame where I'm teaching a class around feminism and technology and black feminism and technology. And I'm often the only person that they've ever seen seeing these things and I'm oversubscribed because people don't even believe it's a thing. They act like it's magic. Yeah, I think you, the role that that you and, and 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 folks in your position play in this public interest technology network is very important to be able to communicate, you know, some of the research and translate that to policymakers or facilitate those connections and inter interactions. I think part of this as a partnership with the community is it's we have to embrace that all aspects of it. So uh, this is really great point. Uh, we're kind of reaching towards the end here um, of the panel, but I want to kind of come back to a question that I, I brought up at the beginning, and it's something I think that Jessica mentioned, but Dr. Wilson, uh, we kind of touched on just briefly at the beginning, and that's the role of, you know, community. And really, you said that many, and I found this, that students who want to get into this space, I mean, are really motivated by, again, not necessarily disrupting some technology or wearing a hoodie, but they, you know, want to build things for community, their communities, and, and from problems that, that they've lived through and solve them for people who they love, right? And so that community aspect is something I, I kind of want to bring us back to because it brings back the human element, the person element. And so can you say from your experience um, something about community? Mm -hmm. uh, we touched on communities of faith. Uh, what's your perspective I'm on say, how those? We really those... did touch on communities of faith, but we really should touch. Should on communities let's talk. Of faith. Let's touch on it now in the last couple minutes that we yeah, have. Yeah, and I'm gonna I'm gonna be quick because I know Jessica, you got something amazing and add and just make that thing beautiful um, in the sense of community. I would simply say that the personal is political, and the political should be public interest technology, and and I say that because the whole notion of Owning one space, one's narrative requires that you are able to translate it to people who look like you. I think it is one thing to have, once again, a messaging campaign that is impactful for those in the congressional halls. However, it is not sustainable unless you have a movement of people behind it. And the reason why I love faith communities to have these conversations about public interest technology, about civic tech, about gov tech, about activism. And now I'm coining black church futurism, right? <laughs> yes, I said it, you heard it here. Black church futurism is that they are places outside of historically black colleges and universities where you have, at least even virtually now, congregations of black bodies and minds thinking through concepts. And if they can take deep concepts on death, on life, they can easily take deep fakes and say, no, it is not a Michael Kors knockoff bag. Get it? Deep fake. Right. They can translate to our communities what this world is, how they can co-create it, and why they should matter. We have been very good at creating a vernacular around incarceration and what does it look like a liberating space against that norm. But we have not done a good job at saying that this new world that we are so excited about on this panel, that I can't figure out how to say, how do you say anti-racist to Mother Montgomery, who has been over the church diaconate board for like 15 years? She gonna look at you like Fallon, speak, and speak a language that is familiar to me. And so that goes back to another script, another code. I think, I, you know, I, and, I, and I love how we use metaphors. Yes, the new Jim Code, Dr. Ruha Benjamin Spellman graduate, right? But also the, the code, right? Of what is the codex we need to translate for communities? And Jessica, what you got? What you got? Come on, jump on in, sister. Um, I, I, it's so hard to follow that. Um, but I, what I want to say is that um, the community is at the center of what we want to do. The community um, knows what it needs. It knows how to, ha it has survived and it will continue to survive. Um, data and data science can lead to accountability, but it's also about collective action and it's about mm -hmm. voices and it's about stories and it's about the public good that can come from centering the community in our work. And, um, and you know, 
I think about my work in mass incarceration, you know, people have survived and people have lived through this and we have to listen to them for those solutions because the people who are most affected by racist policy are the people who have the un understanding and the knowledge and the ability to solve those problems. We cannot silo them. We cannot, um, you know, keep them away from this process and this, this, we have to center them. They have to be at not just at the table, they have to be the table and build the table. They are, they are the, the whole reason why we are here is for them. Yeah, well, I mean, what a great way to, to end the panel with that call to action. This is the vocation, you know, for us to really go from here, from this convening to our work, to our lives, to our communities to help create this anti-racist future. So I just want to thank my, three incredible guests and for all of those uh, here at the convening for joining us for this last uh, session and um, I want to thank you from uh, from my deep of my heart to new America and the pit UN uh, community uh, with that uh, thank you